It's episode 121 of the Sleep Whisperer podcast. Happy Wednesday. I'm super excited for this episode in which I welcome Dr. Anjali Huda. Like the powerhouse that she is, she takes us through the depth of autoimmunity and the interconnection between gut health and sleep. This is a no-filter interview where we dive deep into dangerous trends, especially in India, on self-prescription of antibiotics, loose prescription of antibiotics by physicians themselves, and ignorance of the importance of the gut in autoimmunity. Dr. Huda scoffs at this trend of running to antibiotics for even minor gut challenges, which could just be indigestion itself. Clearly, She's making an impact and that's why I'm thrilled to have her on the show today. Over the course of the next hour, we discuss the hot topic of autoimmune disease and what they are. She walks us through what we should avoid if we want to keep our gut healthy. We discuss whether the connection between the health of the gut and the autoimmune challenge is overlooked in mainstream medicine. And finally... We look at whether the trend is to ignore the basics of health while looking into complex protocols. I hope you enjoyed this episode as well. An obesity advanced metabolic and functional medicine specialist, Dr. Huda studied internal medicine in the U.S. and trained with renowned medical practitioners in U.S. She also holds a fellowship in clinical nutrition and obesity medicine from U.S., and is an IFM certified physician. Along with her international patients, she now also focuses on the Indian population to give them the best care with the scientific approach. Dr. Huda is the author of the best-selling book, Think Eat, Live Smart. She's focused on utilizing her years of learning and experience attained in the US, the bedrock of functional health, to treat people with chronic lifestyle issues in India. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, Author and Yogini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer Podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Dr. Anjali Huda, welcome to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. And today we are speaking about gut health, autoimmunity and sleep. And we've had several conversations on the podcast about gut health. They've all been very popular and I don't think we can ever speak enough about gut health. And I know this is a passionate area for you. I heard you speak about it at a conference and there was extensive information that you shared And um, I would love for us to get started by just looking into um, why autoimmunity is so prevalent today and are people in the general population bringing the adequate attention to looking at root causes and gut health or is that missing in mainstream medicine? Yeah, I think uh, the gut health as per se, is not recognized by the mainstream uh, medical field because it's uh, something even a gastroenterologist does not usually recognize this as something that is causing autoimmunity because the, the, the gut barrier which exists because if you're reabsorbing the toxins back into your circulation, that gut barrier is broken down. But how do we recognize this in the long term? That is what is missing from a lot of practitioners out there. You know, a lot of people find us or uh, find about gut when they are going through something when a 
mainstream practitioners not able to fix the problem, then people come looking for, you know, functional medicine experts, or they'll come looking for people who know how to treat and, you know, diagnose and treat a gut. So it's, it's, it's sad, but I think, you know, like podcasts like yours, we can spread more information, people will know more and they'll seek help and they'll get tested and treated more often. And do you feel that when it comes to even understanding autoimmune conditions that uh, people take a very long time to even realize that they have something which is autoimmune in nature? And how do people actually get diagnosed with something autoimmune? Um, I think it really matters from condition to condition. Most of the people uh, don't know about. So most common is autoimmune thyroid, the Hashimoto's. So most common people will have hypothyroid, but they probably won't know what kind of uh, hypothyroid they have. So that is one of the most common and easily recognized. And, uh, you know, the, the mainstream practitioners will order the antibodies and everything. And then they come to know it's autoimmune. So once uh, you come to know that this is an autoimmune condition, it will usually be associated with other uh, autoimmune conditions. The autoimmunity doesn't uh, focus on one organ. It, it basically is, you know, systematic organs. Um, you know, there is a spread and they will be affected in the long run. And most of the people don't recognize this uh, autoimmunity as something which is bothering them till they actually get uh, diagnosed with an autoimmune condition let's say they have an inflammatory bowel disease or they have rheumatoid arthritis or sle or something so these are the main um, diseases by which they come to know there is autoimmunity and then when they come to know it's usually too late in the condition uh, to do any preventive uh, method of uh, treating them so then it becomes more treatment and uh, more counseling and it's it becomes slow uh, the the treatment becomes slow because already advanced to a level which is uh, not preventable but yeah it can definitely be stopped at the point where it is diagnosed if they seek help in a in a in a quick manner you mentioned Hashimoto's and I must ask you this because I've spoken about gluten on so many episodes. However, a lot of times Indians have asked me why a food that we've been eating for several generations should be a problem, especially when I mention it compared to Hashimoto's. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about gluten given that you bring the Indian perspective and do we need to be avoiding gluten when and as Indians, we've been eating it forever. And uh, if so, why? how is gluten linked to Hashimoto's in particular, but most autoimmune conditions as well? The story of gluten is such that um, it's something which is inflammatory by nature. And because the molecule, the gluten molecule itself, with time, as we age, it becomes more difficult for it to you know, get through the gut barrier and uh, it's it, it causes the lining damage. But if you talk about, let's say we talk about our ancestors eating gluten for so long and nothing really happened. Well, the autoimmunity was no, not prevalent at that time, one. So we are not saying gluten is causing the problem. We are saying avoid gluten if you have a problem. You know, there are two different things. So it's not like um, I should, I, if I'm healthy completely, I should stop having gluten. So that's totally a personal choice, you know, because gluten sensitivity is something that cannot be measured. Gluten allergy is a measurable thing, but sensitivity is not measured. It's only when you give up gluten, you'll know that you're sensitive to it. Mm. And as far as the gluten is concerned, um, now it's now the gluten molecule has changed. You know, the wheat has changed from what we were eating when we were when I was a kid. Um, the gluten molecule, it's now genetically modified. It's it's too many pesticides are used on it. So that it's not the same wheat as we ate before. It's not ancient grain anymore. It's it's become over, it's it's gone into overproduction because of uh, need. 
of the universe of the of, of, of our continent people need more and more gluten uh, that's why the production is high production is high it's made higher by genetically modifying the seed and then also using a lot and lot of um, things on the on the on, on the wheat plant which really is not humanly uh, i mean it should not even be consumed from my point of view but yeah you will always have this debate about gluten with and it's very difficult to make people understand why gluten is not what you should have now. Mm. That's a good point that you made. And um, in your patient population, since you work so much with autoimmune conditions, is um, do you notice any bidirectional axis between autoimmunity and sleep where each is affecting the other? As I said, autoimmunity is not... Uh, not focused on one organ you know it is a it's a multi-organ problem and um, sleep per se can be affected just because you're you're you know it's like gut brain connection so if you have a gut if you have a bad gut it affects your brain it can cause you anxiety it can cause you depression it can cause you alzheimer's it can cause you parkinson's and insomnia so it it will eventually affect. If it didn't affect today, it will because it's a direct gut-brain connection. You know that every all this, most of the 80% of serotonin is in the gut. And if we are altering the gut function in some way, we are making it leaky gut or we are having SIBO or we are having um, you know, inflammation, it's going to affect the sleep, definitely. Mm. And a lot of times people who do struggle with um, some autoimmune condition, they generally say that they don't have gut issues. So common thing that you hear is I have no issues with my gut. So why should I bring attention to my gut? And it's hard to make people understand how the gut is actually linked to everything else. So is there a way that people can understand how gut issues impact everything that symptoms are are symptoms more than just digestive symptoms when it comes to the gut yes very good question in fact i was also going to make an instagram video on this particular subject this mm. because people when they come if they don't have a bloating or indigestion or constipation they think the gut's okay and a lot of you know, my colleagues will also dismiss it. Okay, forget it. This, the gut is okay. But the point is not that. Point is if you even have a insulin resistance, your gut is not okay. If you have overweight, your gut is not okay. If you're overweight, gut's not okay. If you are having allergy, gut's not okay. You're having a headache, gut's not okay. So you, you see everything points to the gut is not okay. So everybody has to realize that every illness that comes to your body starts with your gut because whatever toxin you put in your mouth, whatever is not excreted, it's still in your circulation and it's causing inflammation. So it's very important to pinpoint the gut inflammation because that's easiest to treat also. So people have to understand that every illness on this planet is coming from the gut, everything. And we commonly hear the term leaky gut and leaky gut is dismissed in the medical world as something which doesn't exist. So I usually like to talk about intestine hyperpermeability, but would you be able to break down what is leaky gut and where, where might the problem actually begin? Uh, see, leaky gut means nothing but your... There, there is villi present on the lining of your gut. And those villi are like the sentries, right? They will either uh, re they'll reabsorb the vitamins and the minerals from your food, and they will push out the things that actually harm your body. So what happens is this, this phenomena gets damaged with excessive toxin abuse. So it can be... Oh, toxin like a gluten, like gliadin, okay? So it can be harmed and that those that villi lining will break. And that means that the things that you should have actually excreted are coming back into circulation because the barrier is broken. Mm. So this is simply as a broken barrier 
getting things into your body which are actually should have been excreted in the first place. So this is what is leaky gut. And that is what is, like you said, permeability. So there is a, there's this membrane with villi on the gut lining. So that membrane is damaged. It gets these tiny, tiny holes in it. And then things escape from that holes. The, the, the micro, you know, the micro toxin comes back into your circulation without you even realizing. And this is like happening every day. You know, you, you start, you had one insult of something. Let's say you had a, a gastric infection, like gastroenteritis, you know, very mm. common infection, right? Yes. Very, very common. Everybody gets it. India, you get it. So yes, often. yes, yes, absolutely. So a simple insult of that nature will damage the lining. And if you did not take care after gastroenteritis episode, your lining is going to get withered down further and further and further till some autoimmunity sets in. And that's when, you know, everything goes wrong. So leaky gut is the first step towards a gut, uh, towards a dysfunction of the body. It can be any organ. So even, <clears throat> sorry, even in Alzheimer's disease, leaky gut is the first thing to start. Then, you know, then you get all these, uh, issues with, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever read Bredesen's protocol. Dr. Bredesen has mm -hmm. talked about gut as your main, you know, main area where the Alzheimer's starts. Yes. Yeah. So then I don't, I, I, I fail to understand when so much is happening to the gut and this leaky gut it should be recognized as something and it is something so such a common sense you know i don't see why the traditional medical practitioners will dismiss it because it is such a common sense thing you know even if you tell a 12 year old kid and tell them you know this is how our gut is even they'll know that you know the villi there's villi everywhere right all the tracts have villi mm. our throat has villi our nose has villi so these are all um these are all protective, but they will either fade away with age or they will be uh, taken down by toxin insults. Yes, and I think you also made a very pertinent point about gastroenteritis being so common. And you mentioned people don't really take care post that kind of infection. And I must also add that um, in India, it's very common for people to self-prescribe antibiotics for something like a GI infection. And I know so many friends who just um, prescribe for I themselves. Can, Deepa, I can go on and on about the antibiotic pres self-prescription in this country. That yes, I would sad. have to talk about that because that is an alarming problem. And I think I've given up the battle in many situations where I've just stopped talking about it. But I'd love for you to share your thoughts about that. Yeah, so it's very common, you know, you, you get a little bit of a loose motion and, you know, uh, I, I don't want to take the names of antibiotics, but I know that people will call the chemist. This is what happens in our country. They call the chemist. I want this and this, and then they'll do a course of it. You see now who knows? Um, now we don't know what the bug was, right? Sometimes it's just a loose stomach because you didn't digest properly or, you know, you, you have to actually let the toxin flow out. And the point is, Unless you have a fever, you shouldn't be taking antibiotics. Yes. Unless you have typhoid, you shouldn't be taking antibiotics. And antibiotics, one course of antibiotic takes your gut 10 years behind, probably even more, probably even more. So, you know, you have to be very careful when you do even a single pill can take your gut many, many days to recover because it just kills your uh, it just kills your good bacteria right away. It is lethal. And unless you're not really sick in ICU or in a hospital, antibiotics over the counter should not even be allowed. You know, there should be a prescription from a physician, actually. And then the chemist should be able to give 
in our country unfortunately prescription is not required unless you have you're on some mental medications you know like a, a sleeping pill or or antidepressant only then a prescription mm-hmm. is required and that bothers me because i am giving somebody so giving a wrong antibiotic again causes resistance right so if you're self medicating you're also causing resistance to your body so that next time if you fall sick your that same antibiotic is not going to work for you because you created resistance because you didn't do dose it properly you didn't take it for the right amount of days or you over to overdid it so there are so many aspects to antibiotic prescri- um, uh, consumption that people don't even realize how bad the the gut simply that that is a that is a setting of a uh, you know a, a a leaky gut that's a setting of a leaky gut because antibiotic is also a toxin just because it comes in therapeutic doses doesn't mean it's not a toxin it's you know a drug can be a poison a drug mm. can be not a poison yes but but i feel most of the time overuse of antibiotics is just poisoning yourself and on that note dr hoda i must share an incident that occurred with me because we were talking about physicians and i actually had a physician in one of my yoga classes and she was a student of mine and every time i would go to teach and my nose was stuffy and i was just getting over a common cold she would push me to take antibiotics saying that the cold was not clearing and typically you know i'm of the impression that you just let it run its course whether you take something or not unless there's a chest infection you shouldn't mess around with that so we also have the other side where sometimes physicians themselves are prescribing antibiotics quite loosely so that's an alarming trend as well but i'm glad that we raised some awareness in this because it's been bothering me bottling this up and unable to speak to anyone who wasn't indian or an indian practitioner so i'm so glad we went into this um but let's come to looking at leaky gut itself because it plays such a big role in sleep as you mentioned serotonin um where do we begin where do we begin if we uh, have any idea that we need to be working on our gut if we've got symptoms be it digestive symptoms or any other symptom where do we begin oh uh, i think the beginning has to be when you tell your, you you actually look at yourself and feel that you're not well you know some people keep living living unwell so a lot of the times here in in india as well as other countries sick care is more prevalent so unless you're really sick you won't go to the physician or you won't you know bother going to the hospital well care is something that okay i am very aware of myself and i don't feel good one day two day three day i need to you know take someone's advice so that kind of approach has to come from the people it has to come because some people like let's say for example there is a pain in your leg for example right but you keep living with that pain you don't want to find the root cause and fix it you keep living with it maybe you will pop in some you know pain meds etc but you're not looking deeply into why that's happening and that's the main way people are avoiding getting well because if they were not well and if they had actually gone to a practitioner or a functional practitioner and said listen doc i am not feeling well something is wrong then it's you know it's our job to find what's wrong you know but if you don't approach anybody i mean i am okay with even going to an ayurvedic expert and saying i'm not well but you have to know you're not well mm. and when you're not well when you're not well you know a simple thing like pain like i mentioned it can take away the sleep it's simple yes. i mean it is that because a pain a pain will cause you know uh, anxiety anxiety will set in as an insomnia and that that vicious uh, cycle just doesn't break so mm. that's why you have to recognize yourself okay i don't feel good you know mentally physically 
people just you know they'll just have a sleeping pill okay i'll just have a sleeping pill and get be done with it but that's 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 your numbing your own brain you know you're numbing it for future you shouldn't be having sleeping pill to sleep that's wrong you should be having a restful sleep because your body feels good your digestion is good um your 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 pooping daily you're exercising on time you're drinking enough water you're eating nourished uh, you know nourishment not just food nourishing yourself and that's what is a healthy body but if there is only one parameter also out i think you should consult a practitioner and is there is would you recommend some basic guidelines to get started for anyone who is just wanting to start that process of lowering systemic inflammation and getting their giving their body an opportunity for gut inflammation to reduce yeah the very good starting points is a basic elimination diet where you eliminate gluten dairy peanuts you know the usual offenders and those those are available on the internet you can always find one even ifm i think has put some of the i i could see some stuff online but elimination is the easiest way to start because if you do 21 days of elimination i think you're i think you can you you you're pretty much sorted then of course if you don't get better you have to seek more help but the basic is this and we spoke about gluten earlier so i'd love to also ask you a question since you mentioned 21 days and is gluten something that you consider reintroducing or is it a food that you feel is uh, to be avoided overall in co- in the I... context of autoimmunity no so if you're not well and you're doing elimination diet there is no reason to not get back on gluten you can if you want but if i really need to pinpoint the inflammation i would need to do some testing and then i would decide whether you should you this person should go back on gluten but for for let's say for long term sake if you already have an autoimmune condition never go back on gluten that's my two cents on it Lovely, Doctor Huja. Do you have any final words to share for someone, maybe in terms of a nighttime routine, something to get started on, just improving the quality of sleep? Because you did mention a valid point about restful sleep without needing sleeping medication, and India is another space where you get easy access to sleeping pills, and therefore people are just self-prescribing that as well. So. uh that was a very key differentiation that you made so is there anything that you would suggest to help restore deep sleep without the need for these interventions like medication i think the basic thing about sleep hygiene which is very under sold by many people sleep hygiene is something which you know people don't even bother about that they don't even go to thinking about what is a sleep hygiene you know sleep hygiene is simple very very you know i'll i'll give you some pointers i don't know if it will help so number one point is when you are retiring to bed dim your lights you know at least an hour before well, your 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 brain needs to know that you're now on low light and it's time to pack up dim your lights read something do not drink any caffeinated beverages after 4 o'clock 4 p.m. if you are a night time sleeper and do not eat a heavy meal before sleeping a lot of people think that if they don't eat carbs they can't sleep but that's completely untrue make sure your workout is at least 4 hours before your bedtime because if you do it very close to bedtime it's possible that you're extremely your your act in activation mode in a fa- in a fat burning and a muscle building mode and you will not be able to sleep because the body is concentrating there so you do these things and then i also suggest playing some nice music in the night which i think most people can do it's very easy but this these are the basic sleep hygiene <coughs> things that people it needs to be practiced you know 
you can there's a lot of uh, healing with breathing i don't know if you that's something you ever thought about but a lot of breathing exercises a lot of um things that relax you you know don't don't watch news don't don't fight with your spouse don't fight with your kids you know everything that is done after 6 pm in the evening will definitely um it will delegate how your sleep is going to be so you have to be very mindful of these changes so sleep hygiene is a is amazing thing that if we can practice in five four five points of this and if you can practice it then nothing like it you don't need meds but people think you know they want to switch off in a second but it takes about an hour or something two hours for your brain to completely um get away uh you know from when you switch off a gadget it takes about 1 to 2 hours for your brain to actually come into the restful mode people don't realize this they they will end up um they'll end up they'll switch off the phone and they'll wait for um half an hour i'm like oh i can't still can't sleep so go back to the phone it doesn't work like that mm-hmm. it's like a full 2 hour thing if you want to do to your body it it's it takes about that much time logically medically it takes about that much time to come to a restful mode because of the all the adrenal activity that's going on when you're looking at your phones and news and whatever and you were so you made such a beautiful point that these are under utilized tools i think that's so right because i see often people searching for complex protocols on the internet when the basic clean up like a night time routine has in pain set in place um so that's a huge point and i think people should begin with all these simple steps before looking at anything deeper and we've got a show mantra which we have all our guests complete if sleep is the new medicine then how would you complete that sentence for us i think there are seven habits of a human being that are all medicine you know sleeping is definitely one of them because if you don't sleep you don't you don't recharge you know sleep is something that you know there are glial cells in your brain and i'll just give a scientific thing to it because that's how people understand more nowadays sure so th- there are like microglia right in your sleep uh, i mean in your brain and they are like the detergents right they're like the detergents of um of, you know they wash out the muck and and they basically recharge your brain all right these are glial cells um so they're like the uh, what do you call it? you know how the detergent i think i mentioned detergent so they're like the detergents of the brain they wash it but they only have that happens only in sleep so you don't expect to have a fresh brain without sleeping at least 7 to 8 hours so if you want your microglia the glial cells to work to act as detergents they need they need you to sleep So I think this is all I'll say. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And where can people find you, Doctor Huda, to know more about? You mentioned Instagram, so I'm sure there's lots of videos for people to look at, or your website. Yeah, my website's under construction. I've just introduced new stuff, um, so that's under construction. But yes, I am definitely um, on Instagram. I post out a lot of videos some are fun and some are knowledge based and some can be just random because it's i don't it's not a business profile but yeah i like to i like to talk about things you know it just doesn't have to be in its medical but it can be anything that will help motivate make people learn make people seek good advice Lovely, Doctor Huda. Thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom with us today on the podcast. And um, I hope all those big recommendations which you made from the most simplest of aspects, which people are missing, strikes the chord in several people, especially in India, and helps them to move past their chronic health issues. I'm glad to be on the podcast. I think we need more and more people like you, and we need to spread the word because health is not something that we should take 
for you know as granted it can definitely get better every day Hey everyone I hope you enjoyed the show just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only this is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional this information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services if you are looking for personal help on your health journey do seek out a medical practitioner please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with your doctor or otherwise qualified healthcare professional it is in no way intended as medical advice as a substitute for medical counseling or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition be sure to always work directly with a qualified health practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding if you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com it is important that you have someone who's qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care especially when it comes to chronic health conditions